Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here at Caring Medical Florida in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm here again with my associate, Danielle Matis. Danielle, today we're going to talk about troubling temperatures. I think all of us know how disturbing like being too hot or too cold can be. And obviously I moved from Chicago to Fort Myers because I, you know, and again, I have, you know, a long <laughs> shirt on, so I tend to be cold. Uh, blooded and uh, obviously I feel better in the in the warmth of Southwest Florida just out of curiosity with any of your pregnancies did your temperature how you sense temperature change? Um, not really actually that okay. wasn't really anything that I noticed but in general um, I do better in the warm weather also okay yeah and then uh, some people some of you probably have noticed that one day your body feels overheated the next a day your body is too cold or one body part is really cold and the other body part is uh, too hot. So there's problems with thermal regulation that relate to problems in the brain which can relate to cervical instability. But also people can have one limb or one foot or one hand feel really, really cold. So today we're going to just talk about problems with temperature regulation that can occur from joint instability? So in general, like for the entire body, um, temperature regulation is actually situated in our hypothalamus in our brain, in very basic terms. While the brain is kind of the powerhouse of it, there is some more localized regulation through the nerves to each foot or leg or whatnot too. Yeah, I think a common thing that we all probably know is that when you have an increase in blood flow, you feel warmer sure. and like in the winter when the blood vessels clamp down, you feel cold. And you know, you and I have been in better shape than we currently are, right? Because we've done half Ironmans yeah. or half marathons together. And when you have more muscle mass, because of the increase in metabolism and increase in blood flow, just like with pregnancy, you get hotter. So there's different joint instabilities and nerve problems that can actually screw yeah. up the uh, the the circulation in a limb and a person's limb can feel hot or feel cold. Absolutely. I just wanted to show like the hypothalamus is in the middle of the brain. What else does the hypothalamus do beside temperature regulation? Um, it actually plays a big role in hormone regulation. So patients um, or people that have hormone imbalances that they just can't seem to get right no matter what kind of therapies and, and treatments and, and medications they try, it could possibly even be related to the hypothalamus up above. And then you see this probably a lot, the various nerve. I would say the most common or kind of easiest example is a lateral knee instability, that perineal nerve, which goes down to the top of the foot. I actually see that quite commonly that that nerve gets irritated or, or pinched or constricted and it doesn't provide, you know, just kind of the adequate nerve flow that it should. And patients will say their foot is cold and it'll actually be colder. We'll feel it and it's colder than the other side, um, even just to palpation. What about patients who've been diagnosed with, well, the old term was reflex sympathetic dystrophy. The new term is complex regional yeah. pain syndrome. How do they present? Um, well, actually, you know what, let me, I'm gonna show a picture. So a lot of times they'll, they'll, they might show up like this. Yeah, so this is the patient, I mean, same patient. This is her hand and then of course that's her foot and you can tell very obviously the difference in color. So patients with CRPS, a lot of times it's on one side of the body. So like you'll look at even both feet together and one will look more, maybe even like a little bit more red, it's colder to touch, maybe there's even some muscle atrophy around it that you can see as compared to the other side that looks healthy, normal color, you know, normal blood flow and feels warm, like a body temperature. I found too when somebody has sympathetic hyperactivity in a limb, the pain can be very, very sharp, like almost, yeah. almost continuously. And then obviously when the sympathetic system is too active it causes vasoconstriction. So that's where you get where it, it might seem a little bit blue. Yeah. Oh, here, this actually shows this. Why don't you explain? Yeah, so what this uh, diagram shows is that in along the, I'll say kind of regular nerves or normal nerves that you know allow us to move and so forth and feed our muscles, 
there's also sympathetic nerves that follow along with it. Especially even related to the spine, if there is a vertebrae rotating out of place, an instability in the spine that might be pushing on a spinal nerve, it's not outside the question to think that it could also be affecting the sympathetic nerve and that flow to that body part. And then this kind of just explains it. So, uh, yeah. so obviously you and I treat joint instability. So what's occurring like right there? So here, just to kind of orient you, so this is um, the vertebrae and then this is actually the spinous process, which you'd be able to feel like, kind of on your back. And then right in this canal is the spinal cord. So what's happening in this picture is there's rotation. You can see how these spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae aren't lining up. There's rotation, which as that bone rotates, it's pinching on nerves um, and or the spinal cord. And then that one is the peripheral nerve. Yeah, so right over here, you can see like this is a peripheral nerve coming out. And if there is shifting or again, rotation or movement of these vertebrae, that nerve lays right there and can be easily pinched. There's easy things that you can do. When you and I examine a joint or examine a limb, it's just common. The first thing we'll do is, you know, we'll just touch it. Just feel it. Yeah. You, know, you, you just feel it. And obviously it's, it should be pretty easy to feel that one limb is cold or, or warmer than the other. And what do we do in the office when we want to get objective? We use this. This is a temperature device that we will use. And, and what's really helpful is it's very easy and you can easily compare one side to the other. So if somebody has one arm that's colder than the other and feels cool, you can get objective data comparing it to the other side. Yeah, and you can even see in this patient, there's in the peripheral fingertips, it's crazy how cold that was. So there's something, some kind of a nerve issue going on in the whole limb in the, that patient. I just wanted to put this up here because we did write a very good article on the internet yeah. called Thermal Regulatory Instability. So anybody who wants to learn more about this, you'll see the article on our website. There's two different kinds of problems with temperature. The one is temperature of the limb, which normally means that there's a nerve problem here. Then there's temperature problems of the whole body, and yeah. we will show you a patient who was explaining that, uh, like for instance, she can no longer sweat and she feels better when she's cold. Like when she feels hot, she f feels like she's going to pass out. Okay. And uh, it's common for our patients, right, especially our neck patients, to have autonomic dysfunction or problems with uh, the autonomic nervous system. And really, the a regulation of temperature, right? Isn't it uh, really the autonomic nervous yeah. system that controls the whole thing? The central controller is the hypothalamus and the periphery is normally the sympathetic system. This just shows in the spinal cord where the various sensations are traveling up to the brain. It's kind of like different roads. You could say sure. that this is a, you know, th this is a road, that's a road, the road to your brain. Mm -hmm. So how, how could a person maybe have an issue where there actually is compression of the spinal cord or there's compression of a nerve and they actually don't have pain? Maybe they have itching. You know, we'll have patients yep. who have vibratory, they'll feel like their body's shaking or a limb shaking or a pulsating or numbness, but they're like, doc, like, I don't get it. Like you're saying I got a pinched nerve or problems with my spinal cord, but I don't have pain. You'll see that in like brachial radial paritis. Like they actually have pinched nerve or encroachments of the nerves in their neck, but it's not painful. It's just this terrible itching. Yes, the nerve is getting pinched, but it really just depends on what part or kind of what type as to what kind of symptom you're gonna get. Not everybody with a pinched nerve, like you said, does get pain. Just depending on, you can kind of see here, this part of the spinal cord, you know, for vibration and touch and so forth, if part of the nerve that's getting pinched is really responsible for that, those are the symptoms that you would feel. And then, you know, there's different syndromes. So obviously, I'm, my name's Ross. I thought we'd talk about Ross. Why syndrome. not? So, no, I've had just, you know, I've had patient or two, not a lot, but the point is there are various syndromes where people have excessive sweating and the we need to remember too that the ganglion for the autonomic nervous system hubs are at the C1, C2, and we've talked about this a lot, where the vagus nerve sits right in front of C1, then the superior sympathetic ganglion sits right at C2. The point is that with the cell phones and the atlas going forward, 
that you can get your autonomic nervous system can get out of balance just from even upper cervical instability, especially if you feel like your temperature regulation of your body is all screwed up. But I definitely have had over the years, not a lot, but I have had few patients that had excessive sweating and they asked me like, well, what causes that? And the, I kind of use the example of, you know, we're in a room and uh, my office at my house is notorious for the temperature sensor being Okay. No, so I probably had, I probably called the air conditioning people maybe like six to eight times over the last several years because it's unbelievable. Like sometimes the room is too hot, like really hot, then other times it's too cold. So it's amazing if the sensor is off. So basically we said yeah. there's temperature sensitive neurons in the brain, especially in the hypothalamus. So let's just say somebody has cervical destructure, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about in a minute, and it's blocking the fluid flow into and out of the brain and the brain pressure goes up, it can affect the temperature sensor yeah. in the brain. So if the temperature sensor in the brain's off, the person can all of a sudden be too hot when they were always never excessively hot and there's nothing they can do about it until they get their neck situation corrected. So why don't you explain what's going on yeah. here? So here, just to orient everybody, um, this is the spinal cord here. So the brain sits up here. And then these, C2, C3, they're all labeled. These are the cervical vertebrae. Um, what should happen is as the spinal cord goes down, you should have like fluid around it. You can see here, like you have this nice kind of white fluid and then it's so significantly reduced and you almost lose it like here and then even on this side of the spinal cord. So this is compression of the spinal cord and the cervical spine. Yeah, and that of course can affect some of those roads or tracks Absolutely. in the spinal cord. This person could have temperature problems there. They can have buzzing down here. Yeah. They can feel like sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had patients where they feel like their head isn't connected to the rest of their body. Yeah. And just to, since we're, since we're here, see McCray's line here, so you can see where the cerebellar tonsil yeah. is a little bit low, so that this person has a little bit of Chiari. Again, just, just to kind of go back to what you were saying, like it's a roadblock, like it blocks fluid flow, like nutrient flow, you know, into your brain. This is another example of it, probably a little bit more severe, where you can see the spinal cord again coming down here, and then you're losing that fluid around it. It's almost like even back here, it's touching the spinal cord. It's definitely touching and kind of indenting it yeah. here on the anterior side. It's not good. And then this is from a herniated disc, because yes, you see yeah. the bone there, so that's from a herniated disc. So here, this is more of a cross-section view. So here is uh, the spinal cord here. Again, this nice kind of round, beautiful shape. You get all the fluid around it. That looks nice, but you see here how the spinal cord loses that round shape. It's more o um, oval or, or oblong. And then even here, it's way more just kind of like stretched out and you've lost that beautiful fluid layer around it. It's getting so compressed that CSF, cerebral spinal fluid flow around it is just having such a harder time going in and out. Yeah, so we just call that spinal cord tension. Yeah. And then remember we said the back of the spinal cord has pain, temperature, touch, mm -hmm. vibration, and see here where the back of the spinal cord is yeah. getting compressed by, well, you could see it here. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. So people can, you guys can take out your own MRIs, get your own MRIs, and if you see where the spinal cord is touching the bone here, obviously do something related to your curve, and if you have clicking, popping, grinding in the neck, then consider getting prolotherapy. Yeah. And then this is what we see on digital motion x-ray. The person's cervical curve right is supposed to be like that. And then this is what we call an S-curve. Mm -hmm. An S-curve. You said cervical destructure earlier. Like this is what that is. Like instead of that nice, beautiful C-curve, it's like serpent-like. We often talk about workstations. So what's your workstation like? And then why do you have your workstation the way you do? My workstation is a sit to stand situation. So I don't sit all day. I, I try to stand and then sit if I need to. And my monitors are up a little bit. So I'm not looking down at okay. my monitor there as eye level as, as I can get them for just yeah. to be my head level. Yeah, I think everybody at home, if you're having any of these symptoms and you know you don't have a good cervical curve, yeah. the first thing to do is you know, definitely get your monitors up. And then 
when you're looking at your monitor because it's easy just to go like this totally. like that like that's not going to help like you you should you know you got to use your muscles like you know you're doing it right when you know you can feel some muscle contraction if I sit for too long, that's what happens. Like, no, none of us can sit with good posture for yeah. every hour of no. the day, right? You kind of start to slouch, and then you look up, and that'll give me a headache if I do it for too long, like pinching on everything. So well, nobody wants a headache, so try to keep it at yep. least a little bit more up. Yep, and then I, this just, just sort of shows you that flexion at the neck stretches the spinal cord up to 24% and the medulla by 14%. So. Almost everybody, when we have them send us their computer setup, everybody's like looking down or everybody's like this. Yeah. So it means that all day long you're getting spinal cord tension, spinal cord tension, spinal cord tension. So at some point you're going to get spinal cord nerve problems yeah. and that's going to give you all kinds of symptoms. And then this just again just shows that nerve tracks go from the spinal cord to the brain. They go to a certain part of the brain and anywhere along here can be a problem. And then why don't you just explain, you know, sure. what happens, like a nerve can only handle so much force. Totally. And it's not typically that all of a sudden, you know, the nerve goes from like zero to a hundred. Not that that couldn't happen, but really what happens is you have like this normal, healthy nerve, you're totally fine, you're asymptomatic. And then the nerve, as it starts to get stretched a bit or, com or compressed, maybe you start to feel symptoms that come and go. Maybe you're not too worried. The nerve is not damaged at that point, but if we keep going and we don't resolve the underlying condition, then you'll actually start to get damage around the nerve. Maybe your symptoms now, you know, they used to come and go, but they're coming much more frequently, yeah. almost becoming consistent. And then we go where really we've actually damaged the nerve. Your symptoms are probably going to be very consistent, if not worsening. Yeah. When you have instability, the body's going to try to protect the nerves. Yeah. So you get muscle spasms, you get all these things. So that's going to give you intermittent symptoms, intermittent coolness, intermittent hot. It's not like very bad, but when the body can't accommodate anymore and it can't protect the nerves anymore, that's when you start getting worse. You have symptoms all the time. And that's often, you know, when the patient comes in to see us because yeah. it's just getting acceleratedly worse. That's the word, acceleratedly. I mean, it is now. <laughs> How would we, if somebody had a, say they come into you and they have a burny pain and it's all cold, the limb. So what would, diagnostically, what would you do in the office? Typically, like I said before, um, the perineal nerve, I'll just use that for an example because that's a very common thing I, I'll see, is I know that the perineal branches off the sciatic at the knee, so that's the first joint I look at. Is there an unstable, wobbly, loose knee? Patients may say, oh yeah, I don't really trust it. You know, I'm afraid it's gonna give out. And then I'll test it under ultrasound. So we'll actually look at the connective tissue and stress the joint, meaning we're gonna move it under ultrasound and see if, quite frankly, if the bones are moving more than they should. Because very easily, because nerves lay close to bone, if those bones are moving more than they should, that nerve just lays right there to get compressed. And I also, in those cases too, would look at the ankle as well as the uh, mm -hmm. perineal nerve does cross over the ankle. And if there is joint instability in either or both of those conditions, then I would have my primary goal be to resolve the joint instability with prolotherapy. But, and you know this too, sometimes if the condition has gone on long enough, just resolving the joint instability is not enough. We actually have to actively work to try to treat the nerve and, and get it to regenerate it some mm -hmm. by doing injections around the nerve as well. Yeah, so what, what do you use for that? Typically I use PRP, or platelet-rich okay. plasma, so we'll get cells from the blood um, to inject around the nerve under ultrasound, okay. along with usually 5% dextrose. If somebody has a real hot uh, limb or foot or cold foot, one of the ways they can figure out whether or not they have joint instability is just like feeling the joint, feeling yeah. the joint, and is there cracking, clicking, popping? Because it's not normal to have your back click and pop, your hip joint click and pop. So if you have a weird sensation, like this whole series, yeah. a strange sensation, and you got clicking, popping in a joint, it's likely that you do have joint instability and the treatment for joint instability. That's ligamentous in origin yeah. is prolotherapy. 
Now, in our patients that come with uh, cervical instability, they have clicking, cracking, popping in their neck, and often we do a diagnostic procedure, which we call neck vitals, right? So what's involved with neck vitals? So usually, you know, patients, new patients for that come in with neck issues and these strange sensations get a digital motion x-ray, which is an x-ray that you're moving. Again, it's dynamic imaging and ultrasounds of, we mentioned their vagus nerve earlier, jugular vein, uh, carotid artery to look at how the blood flow is in and out of the brain. And most commonly what we see is the blood flow is getting kinked on the way out, essentially. That jugular vein is narrowing or getting compressed on one or both sides. And that causes high brain pressure, which yes. can affect any part of the brain, including yeah. the hypothalamus, including thermoregulation. I'm actually here with somebody who I just met. So, Jessica, we appreciate you talking to us today. And you have an interesting symptom that came on about almost a year after a car accident and some other things happened. And if you would just explain like what's going on with the temperature in your body. Yeah, so I've just been having some temperature regulation issues, it seems like. Um, first of all, I can't sweat, uh, which is very strange because I used to work out and I would just be dripping sweat and now it's like I can't, like my body won't produce sweat for whatever reason. Um, I also have trouble like I'm either extremely hot or extremely cold all of the time. Um, and then when I get really hot, um, I feel like I'm going to faint. Um, so it's just been very difficult to deal with. So you feel better like when you're really cold, I yes, guess. Yes, I feel better. Like right now my, my fingertips are like very cold and okay. they stay that way and my toes okay. are, and I have on two pairs of socks and they feel like ice cubes. Okay, so most of the time you're feeling very cold. Yes. Okay. I don't like to get hot right now. I don't want to get hot. Okay. So, well, let's just say like, you know, you live in Florida, right? You live mm -hmm. in Northern Florida. So if it was a really hot day, like what would you do? Stay inside. Okay. <laughs> in you, the air conditioner. <laughs> you would just stay inside. Yeah. And has the, like when you take a shower or whatever, have you had to adjust like? Yes. I used to enjoy taking like hot baths after I would work out. Mm -hmm. um, I would stay in there for like 30 minutes, just letting my muscles, you know, like decompress and feel better, like an Epsom salt bath. Now I can't really do that. Um, they have to be like lukewarm and maybe for like 10 minutes. Okay. Or either I have to stand up in the shower um, or sit in the shower if I can't stand. And that also has to be like lukewarm. And a lot of times I'll end it with like a cold, um, I'll turn to the cold and let it just run on me. So I'm cold when I get out. Okay. So say, it was a really hot day, you know, you just decided like I got to do something mm -hmm. and you went out and you got overheated, like what, what would you feel? I would feel really lightheaded. Um, I would feel dizzy. I would feel short of breath um, and like, a, you know, have some presyncope issues, like feeling like I'm going to faint. I would probably have to lie down, drink a lot of water, Okay. Uh, put my feet up. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to come to Caring Medical. Yes. And these are that those are significant symptoms, but you have some other symptoms too, right? That yes. bother you. I have other symptoms. I have um, some vision problems, um, some circulation issues. I also have extreme digestive issues now that came on after this. Um, I'm trying to think, light sensitivity, um, some headaches occasionally, a lot of neck pain. That's all the time. I mean, so yeah. Why did you think that we could help you? Well, after doing about five or six months of research, um, I went, I basically had to get everything else ruled out. Um, when you start having tachycardia, and that's pretty scary. So initially I went to a cardiologist, um, and then, you know, I went to a neurologist because then you start thinking, oh, well, I need to get my brain checked out and make sure it's working properly. Um, and then I found, you know, your name through a Facebook group and also a girl that I follow on Instagram randomly comes to see you. So I started reading about it and it just made sense that this could be a cause of what's going on in my body. And then you were noticing too, like you... Yeah, my you, neck clicks all the time. Like I have, you know, it's just very clicky and um, unstable essentially, but there's a lot of pain too. 
And for most of your life, though, you were you loved like working out. Like you oh, were yes. you were an avid gym person. Yes, runner. I would definitely say um, I would say an athlete. Um, I played sports my whole life. I played sports throughout college. I played sports throughout um, like intramural sports through law school, and then you know even after law school, I've recently played kickball a couple of years and like just running and working out probably four or five times a week. What other sports did you play, like competitive sports, like with? In col- uh, in yeah, in college. Uh, soccer and basketball. Okay. Um, yeah. And then just through college, I did intramurals, like softball, um, soccer, kickball, stuff like that. A lot of running. Okay. And then you notice, too, there's like some other body parts are starting to get clicky, too, right? Yes. Um, my chest, um, about six months ago, it started to get very clicky, like... Okay. This would start popping, and that never happened before. Okay. Um, some of my joints would start popping too, like okay. my ankles out of nowhere. Thought my body was falling apart. Still feels like it is. <laughs> Prior to coming here, did you try anything? Did you try any treatments? Um, did you go see anybody? I saw my chiropractor one time. He did a little bit of acupuncture. Okay. Um, but to be honest, I've been so terrified since all of this started that okay. you know I didn't. I was very weary about someone touching me or okay anything. Okay, right I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Did uh, you know? Obviously, you know, college graduate, attorney, um, highly intelligent. Have you noticed any changes in? Like your problem solving ability yes. or um, your anxiety level or <laughs> um, I have extreme brain fog um, I cannot remember things that happened like five seconds ago unfortunately and for me that's very uncharacteristic mm-hmm. I I mean obviously made it through seven years of school you know so um, it's just that's probably been the most disheartening part of this like I went to I actually went to a functional neurologist and they did some brain testing and I had a reading comprehension test for about this big of a paragraph that I failed. Okay. And for me, that was when I was like, okay, my brain is definitely affected. Okay. And, well, if any of this applies to you, we'd obviously love to see you at Caring Medical. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you.